This is a Momentum Media production. The SMSF Advisor Show. Your expert insights into the biggest things shaping the SMSF advice industry. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for part two of our wrap of the SMSF Association National Conference. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Miranda. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, So we're going to be speaking to a couple of more speakers for this episode, starting with uh, Belinda Aisbitt. We'll also be speaking with uh, Mark Ellum from Acurium and uh, Peter Williams from Deloitte, who will be delving into some of the disruption happening in the space and some of the trends and potential emerging risk areas. Yeah, so these are three fantastic speakers, very highly regarded, obviously, in the industry. And I'm sure you're going to get some great insights that we had with each of these speakers. And at the end, we'll give a bit of a wrap around what our key takeaways were from their specific conference. So we hope you enjoy. So we're now joined by Belinda Aisbitt, uh, Director of Supersphere. Um, she did a session with the ATO this morning, uh, Paul Delahunty from the ATO, uh, which covered off a couple of the sort of issues cropping up from SMSF auditors. Um, and the ATO sort of provided their view on a couple of those. Uh, what were some of the sort of key things that you covered this morning, Belinda? Yeah, that's a tough question because we covered a lot of real estate uh, from the auditors of the group. So we, we covered initially the super stream because that's uh, the rollovers is not something that auditors have had to really consider from a timing point of view. So sure, when a rollover comes in or leaves the fund, we've got an audit process to go through. We've never had it impact really the payment standards or uh, had to have a look at the time frame. Uh, so forewarning, I guess, is it? Well, look, if you had a rollover in before, we never cared when the request was made or when it started, whereas now we have to go, all right, well, we've got three days from this point. Uh, if we, the trustees don't meet that three-day period, then there are consequences for the audit, which might be a, a Part B audit opinion qualification or ATR reporting, depending on the circumstances. So that's not something auditors have ever had to do before. It was interesting, Paul, from the, the ATO mentioned that, well, the rules have been in for since March, but we don't actually have to essentially um, act on the non-compliance until the, the 2022 audit season. So March last year was fine. We were given six months. We've got this. Uh, it's going to be something that hits the, the 22 audit. Um, so auditors will need to update their audit programs. We'll need to train their staff to make sure that those uh, elements are actually covered off in each audit. Yeah, I imagine that will be a big thing. I also thought some of the thing, other things you mentioned were interesting, such as the um, NEIL member balances, because I think that's something that comes up for our readers. Yeah, so I thought that was, uh, when we had that question raised at the ADG, because so, I get advanced notice of the question, I'm like, okay, well, this is going to be a nice, easy question. You know, what is a NEIL member balance equate to? Do you have a member or do you not? And I, you know, in my head I'm talking about, all right, well, we'll go through what does the deed say. The deed will tell you when someone's considered a member from the fund's perspective. And then I went to a session yesterday and they were talking about, uh, you know, are you a member if you don't have anything in that you have to have a beneficial interest in. So from the legislative or legal point of view, do you have a member versus what the deed says? I'm like, okay, so it's not as simple an answer as what I initially thought. And we have lots of funds where you'll have um, mum and dad in the fund and they'll admit a child but not have any members or we'll have mum and dad in the fund and they'll admit an adult child in preparation for when mum and dad pass away or there's a bit of um, you know, mental decline or something like that. And that adult child in the fund has no balance and doesn't ever attend to have a balance. So I was like, okay, well, how do we then you know, overlay that with our audit risks and, and what procedures? So. The question that was raised was, well, what are my audit risks? How am I supposed to, and is there something I should be doing? And, you know, the ATO's perspective, well, as long as there's no mischief, uh, then, you know, there's not any great, you know, drama with having a new member balance uh, in the fund. It's an interesting conversation when you start to think about, well, I think there's a simple answer, but then when you have the lawyers talking about it, it's often not a simple answer. So your other challenge for this conference is to audit other sessions. Yeah. Uh, So what have you found so far that has been quite interesting? Well, yeah, Graham Colley and the use of goats and sheep in the session, I didn't think I would have to (laughs) have to try and pick which is a goat and which is a sheep. So I thought that was fabulous. Yeah, so related parties were talking about there quite clearly. Yeah, so that was was fantastic. So, no, look, in terms of auditing the conference, um, my suggestion to the conference committee was, well, why don't we actually have an auditor attend the sessions, have a look at what the audit risks are, have a look at how the auditors should in practice be managing these scenarios because it's very easy to talk up on a stage about 
here's a problem, here's what trustees want. Yeah. But then when it comes to the auditor, it's like, well, okay, so how are we actually supposed to manage this? How are we supposed to deal or rectify yeah. it? So my, my idea was, well, we'll audit the conference. I'll go to a couple of the sessions, pick out the bits that I think are relevant for auditors. Uh, and I've had auditors send me questions. So this this conference session here, you know, what do we do with this bit? So I think it'll, it'll be uh, an interesting one to just then focus on the audit aspects of yep. what we've heard from other presenters. So drill down into, well, in practice, this is how you should fix it. This is how you should audit it. These are the questions you should ask. This is what happens when you don't get the answers to your questions and this is the risks that you need to manage. So should I be nervous that you're going to come into mine and pull mine apart then as well? Well, look, I think <laughs> you've actually structured the conference very well and I think we're presenting at the same time. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> But it will make a note for next year. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, uh, thank you for joining us for our SMS Advisor Show. You always have a busy schedule here. You are always very generous with your time. Well, so thank you. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. So we're now joined by Mark Ellum, Head of uh, Education at Acurium. Hi Mark. G'day, how are you? Good, thanks. And yourself? Very good, very good. Having a wonderful time here. It's great to be back, isn't it? It's wonderful to be back in person <laughs> and seeing everyone other than with a frame around their head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you're making people do work, like in workshops, like getting calculators out and pens. And, and I can <laughs> see then that they're actually doing the work yeah. or they're not doing the work. Yeah, so, great. they no, can just good. like mute the screen and yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, no, it, it is. It's, it's great. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so you, um, your workshop was focused around those changes that we saw with uh, ECPI and certain funds being able to make a choice around how they, what method they pick to calculate that. Yes, yes, and I think one of the things to come out of the workshop that I focused on for the people is to realise that it's not going to be every SMSF that will have that choice to whether to apply the default current approach or to make a choice to effectively apply the proportionate method for the entire year, but importantly it's being able to identify with those for those funds that would have the choice yeah. and then whether what's the effect of making the, uh, of have, making the choice to apply proportionate method for the whole year on the tax outcome it's yeah. really it's about tax yeah correct you yeah. Know, and clients want to pay as little tax as possible or yeah. maximize the refund so if the fund does have that option to make a choice how's that going to affect that tax outcome and that'll be dependent upon when what certain events happen like CGT yeah. events yeah when, the timing, timing of them, when they happen in a period of deemed segregation or not, and whether it results in a loss or a gain. We went through a scenario where we had a capital gain and it was, well, we want to make the choice because that'll give us a higher ECPI. But then if we turned it into a capital loss, um, we don't want to make the choice, you know, or if it happens in a period of deemed segregation and it's a loss, well, we do want to make the choice, so, so we preserve yeah. that loss. So it's an interesting concept because I think statistically, Curium's obviously got a lot of data around how many funds this legislation was going to impact. Yeah. But strategically, we're now in a environment whereby we can we can strategically plan some of these outcomes so that we can go. Well, yeah. Do are we just going to stick with the default, or do we actually want to go about? making a tax planning choice here to um, you know, apply, in essence, what I call the old method. <laughs> yeah, and it's important, the point you make there is that about planning, yeah. because it was great to see that we had some tax advisors, or not tax advisors, financial advisors, advisors in the room, yeah. because it's not just, ECPI is not just a domain of accountants and actuaries, yeah. right, and, and recording what's happened. Yes, we've got to prepare last year's financials and tax returns, but if your financial advisor making a recommendation to sell an asset, it's important to know, well, how is the, the um, gain or loss going to be treated from a tax viewpoint, yeah, depending on does the fund have a choice? Mm. You know, and then, of course, the advisor then talking to the accountant administrator who's preparing and going, well, is, we believe this should be the outcome. Is it going to be the outcome? Yeah. Well, they make the choice. Yeah. Now, so what, what role is the actuary going to play here? And I guess that's part of the, the journey for everyone to understand, like, you know, who's who in the zoo. And so what, what role do you see the actuaries providing there in, in providing the options to understand how choice will work? Well, what we'll be able to do is that once you identify your fund has choice, yep. has the option for choice, but we'll be able to provide the ECPI percentage under either method, you know, yep. whether they're in the default method or you make the choice. And importantly, you know, everyone realised in the workshop that just because um, you go from exercising choice or not exercising choice, that ECPI percentage that applies to the 
relevant period is not going to be the same. Mm. So if you first apply the default method, so you've got a period of unsegregated and a period of DEAN, so we're getting the eCPI percentage, it's only going to apply for that period of unsegregated. Then if you say, oh no, we're going to exercise choice, we want to see now what is the effect on tax by making the choice, assuming the fund has that ability to make the choice, and what's the tax outcome going to be? Well, that eCPI percentage is now going to apply for the entire year. And it'll take into account that period of deemed segregation. So effectively uplift that eCPI yeah. percentage. So you just can't do that. But what we'll do at, uh, as actuaries is we can provide both eCPI percentages for you to run your reports under each method and look what the tax outcome is. And obviously, that the client make the decision, but I think it'll be an easy choice yeah. for the trustees. <laughs> and just one other point on that is, is to importantly ensure that the uh, trustees record that decision. Like in minutes yeah. resolutions, Please. it's their decision. It's not the decision of the accountant, the actuary, or the advisor. It's the decision of the trustees Trustee and the report as such. Yeah, absolutely. So any other tips, uh, you know, questions that were sort of fired at you at the at the workshop that uh, really stuck out in your mind? Well, we started off by with, a, with an exercise. I got them working straight away from yeah. one on working out whether a fund had disregarded small fund assets. And just keep in mind that regardless of the new rules, yeah. disregarded small fund assets remains an important concept yeah. to determine. And importantly, that the test, 1.6 million, did not go up with the increase in the general transfer balance cap. So well, that, that important thing, that disregard a small fund asset is that it's an important test that's done on an annual basis. Well, that's great, I think. That's Miranda, anything you want to add to that? No, I think you've summed it up. Uh, wonderful. Yeah, well, it's great to be back face to face. I know we've had a beer together, so yep. I seem to have had a beer with most of the people that I've interviewed here. So it's a bit of a theme in that. But anyway, we won't go there. But yep. um, once again, it, yeah, it's fantastic to get your insights. Uh, we've had you on the advisor show before. We'll be having you on again. Much appreciated, mate. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting Thank me. You. All right, we are now joined by Pete Williams, Chief Edge Officer for the Centre for Edge at Deloitte. Um, Peter, thank you for joining us, most importantly. The last time I saw you here, I think it was 2015-ish, I think it was, yeah, and um, yeah. blew my mind is probably the right way to that, that session. It was fantastic because, uh, well, I, one, I love the way you actually present, um, but it really started to open my eyes up to what an industry is going to start to look like yeah. and, and the, 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 the concept of disruption started to be born. And you, you were able to bring examples from, you know, from the exhibition space yeah. to how disruption is evolving. So you know, we're seven years on now. Yeah. Um, what's the sort of stuff that you, know, you can see today? It's sort of back, back, in, back in the time, we were sort of looking at it and saying that it was clearly a disruptor for people moving out or moving towards retirement. Yeah. You know, it was like, you know what, I've got this chunk of cash now. Um, I want to be able to be more proactive with how I use it, what I do with it. Yeah. Um, so that was that was a feature. But we were also then starting to see almost like the digitization of financial services popping up in a range of ways. And, and there was even one there that I, I sort of called out like an ethical super fund called Zupa, which ultimately failed. Yeah. But again, it was it sort of, it's a bit like I even actually said, you know, if you want to have a look at something that might fly, it's mentioned Bitcoin. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> just that little chest. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> but, but, but so, so let's wind forward. So what we're seeing is that um, the, and what, the, the other thing I talked about was this sort of notion of it's not like one big, you know, like Amazon disrupts Borders yeah. bookstore type thing. It's this sort of mosquito fleet of smaller players who are getting really good at something. So, you know, whether it's BGL or class or whether yep. it's, um, you know, Deloitte doing self-managed super fund audits where, you know, there's, there's a lot of players in there and they were all innovating. Probably not as quickly as what we're seeing with the fintechs now yep. and the fintech model has exploded over that last seven years. So we're seeing a lot of change there. But yeah. but this notion of um, people getting more used to having information about topics in their hands, in a smartphone, um, being more comfortable with experimenting and exploring, um, combined with the reduction in cost of setting up, managing, administering a super fund, um, we're starting to say, well, it's not just the old people now, it's that sort of, you know, me and my missus are in our thirties. We've yeah. got two hundred grand. And, super oh, you journey. know, it's going to cost us two grand a year, maybe to run. And yeah, why don't we do that? Yeah. Now, 
you know, it, I, I do remember saying that uh, at the time that I had to advise my sister not to go into an SMS edit because um, clothes wasn't a proper category. But, <laughs> um, but again, so and, I, and but I think the I, I think there's a it, it hasn't run away from a like a compliance thing. There's been you know the ability to sort of borrow and stuff coming out, but yeah. uh, and I think there's still this potentially maybe a, a little bit of a fear factor. But I think the more that the industry can adopt the, the types of things that we're seeing with the you know the the fintech apps and all yeah. that stuff. Um, I mean, there's you know the people behind this booth, the independent reserve and the crypto stuff. It yeah. um, it really does scare me. Yeah. Um, I and I think the um, the sort of fear of missing out. It's you know, I, I bought some crypto early, but, you know, I, there's something like 18,000 coins out there now, and there might be, there'd be two that I might put money into. Yeah. Um, and it just worries me that there's all this, and now there's all these NFTs and all that yeah. stuff. And, and it's, it's and all it, that new tech that's yeah, it's coming all, but again, into it, it's sort it? of, you know, I, I'm often seeing it's fear of missing out. Yeah. And, you know, I heard such and such, you know, yeah, it's, somebody. It's the barbecue conversation. Yeah, yeah so. and it's like, you know, the old rules of, you um, you don't invest in stuff you don't understand. Yeah. And, and, you know, oh, I heard that somebody in the Netherlands or New Zealand or somewhere sold everything and, like, put everything into Bitcoin and they made, you know, 20 million bucks. And it's like, yeah, did you hear about the ones that yeah. sold everything? <laughs> you know, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I do think that um, it's incumbent on, um, <clears throat> on advisors and people in the space to be, you know, to sort of tough love. I think yeah. that's what you want. I've got my financial advisor. He's tough, you know. Yeah. He's, no, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we've got a deal like you go and do the speculative stuff, Pete, with that part of the portfolio, yeah. and I'll look after most of it. Yeah. And the speculative part's actually doing yeah. him, but we won't <laughs> go into that too much. But again, it's that sort of. Um, I, I do think that we're we're moving into an era of. Um, not everyone, but a lot more people, a lot more informed. And for the presentation I'm doing today on disruption, I just rang my kids. Uh, sort of 30, 29, 28, um, Rank, what are you guys on? Oh, I'm using steak to do this, and I'm right. using Perla to do that, and oh, I've got spaceship, but I don't really like this, and oh, do you know this Finfluencer? Okay. So th- it's a, it's an interesting world where we're seeing people getting financial advice on TikTok. Um, <laughs> so, you know, like, yeah. um, but this younger cohort, they're smart, That's they're savvy, they've yeah. got big earning potential, and um, so, yeah, I, I think that the industry's got a long way to run, and I, and I, I personally think that you're going to see retail just sort of maybe not disappear but wither away right. a bit and I think it's really going to be industry for the sort of the not so engaged and it's going to be more SMSFs for those sort of um, you know those younger people yeah. engaged and, we're, and we've and seen the SMSF well. yeah. association with data from the classes and BGL start to dispel those myths you know yeah. like because it's all this regulatory sort of costing that yeah. was so far from what the real sort of thing was and, and over time the, the yeah, way that, I mean, the I saw that, one the other day that was like, um, oh, it's 13 grand if you want to run one. And yeah. I'm like, well, you know, just walk around this hall. It wasn't kind of, <laughs> yeah. you've got 20 investment, it cost you about two and a half grand a year, yeah. or it might cost you 500 bucks, yeah. you know. Well, okay. That's, that's, um, sorry. that's, yeah. that's probably less than what you, you would be paying, yep. you know, to an industry fund if you've got, you know, a certain amount of money in there. But, it, but again... It's the it's the control. It's making sure that people are getting the right access to advice. They understand the compliance, and yeah, and and that's the that's the interesting sort of part yeah. about it. And I guess just quickly, um, the other part that you're talking about is obviously cyber security. So yeah. just a couple of comments, I guess, on that. Oh, it's, if you can, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually going to talk a, a little bit more about scams because yeah. the the likelihood of you know somebody you know hacking the average punto and ransom wearing them is, is pretty low. Yeah. You know, they're going to go after bigger organisations. But you you are getting scam calls. I get them almost on a daily basis. Yeah. You know, my wife and I would say we're getting them on a daily basis. So, you know, we're the Australian Taxation Office or we're Amazon. And it's um, – and I, I ran a, a little test with a startup recently where we actually got a white hacker to um, go out and do some phishing stuff with our staff. And 30% of them followed it. And it's like – because it looks like, oh, this sort of looks real. Um, and, and it's it's a really huge thing. And, and and I think that this industry needs to be, one, really careful and making sure that if anybody, people are starting to sort of use you guys, yeah. oh, you know, we're from the ATO and you've got an SMSF sort of scams. But, um, yeah, just I think 
everybody in financial services has got a responsibility to, to help people to send them out. I know the association's doing it, but I would sort of be saying, out, you know, people, like, get it out there. And, and the, 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 one, the thing is, you know, like, if, if you don't know who they are, just hang up. Yeah. And if it's really important, uh, <laughs> they'll find you some other way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for giving us a bit of an overview about what you're speaking about and some of the predictions and risk areas. Uh, really looking forward to watching the session. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, no worries. You. Yeah, much appreciated. Anything else you, you think I haven't mentioned that you thought I would have? Uh, no, I reckon that's... No, I reckon that's yeah. pretty good. I, maybe, you know, maybe the only other... If you were going to give advice to this industry... Yeah. You might sort of say, well, there's a lot of noise around the fintechs and all that stuff. Yep. And I think the share of voice of the SMSF, just in my view, has yep. probably declined a bit. Yes. I don't hear as much about it. Yeah. Um, so, but, that, but some of that, I think, has been the regulator's approach to it. Yeah. Like they've, they've really, yeah. it's been sledgehammer. Um, yeah. So that's, that's been the challenge. So with all the advice reviews and stuff coming out... Um, the hope is is that they can kind of sort of stick themselves yeah, because, stick their, stick because their I, up I think again the now. problem I've got is you know if I go on Twitter you know, I'm getting all these ads for this idiotic um, bullshit crypto coins and yeah, stuff yeah. And, and I'm not talking you know the bitcoins and the ethereums which okay you know have a, yep. you'll be speaking I didn't even have a pun but it's like all this nonsensical stuff and oh this is going to the moon and quick get on this and yeah, it's yeah. and it's it, and it's unregulated yeah that's the and, other and thing and the sad part about it is it's global yeah um, so yeah. not yeah. And then, you know, you see it at the F1s, you've got Crypto.com yeah. and you see it at the footy now, they're footy, doing yeah, NFTs yeah, with yeah. the AFL and, uh, yeah. and it's a bit like, oh. Yeah. And, and, and to me, it, it is reminiscent of the dot-com boom yeah. where, you know, for every Amazon and Google that came out of there, yeah. it was a hell of a lot that sort of um, was overvalued, overhyped yeah. and, yeah. Um, you know, underperformed. Yeah. So Very good. All right. No worries. Thank, yeah, thank you. So Thanks. Sorry in the session. Like thank you. Cheers. No worries. You're all good. So we hope you enjoyed those conversations that we had with uh, Belinda Aisbert, Mark Allen, and Pete Williams. Miranda, as we wrap up the conference over what was a fantastic two and a half days, obviously you are front and centre in a lot of sessions, as is the rest of the team at SMSF Advisor that was there. Can I get you to share with our audience some of the key takeaways that you got from the conference? Yeah, there were certainly uh, plenty of interesting little updates and um, things happening as always at the SMSF conference. So one of the things I found interesting in the ATO audit session with uh, Belinda Aisbert was just some of the um, things that the ATO has been monitoring with those independent standards. Uh, so they've seen a big shift in SMSF's changing auditors, which they see is obviously quite a positive response to the whole changes happening there. It means that firms have taken the time to do that restructuring and they're quite happy with how it's going. However, they are still sort of seeing some problems with independents out there. So it's very much a big focus for them. Yeah. So the ATO had some fantastic representation at the conference, didn't they? I think um, I heard commentary that there was around 25 delegates at the conference, so they naturally have a booth in the exhibitor space. But I think that's really important from an industry point of view to have such strong representation from, you know, not only are they from an income tax perspective, but on a regulatory perspective as well. And they actively engage in our industry. And I think the strength of our industry is because of strong stakeholder engagement and, you know, the ability for the ATO to be represented and you know, we spoke, you know, they, they obviously had uh, sessions there and, and in addition to kind of given broader addresses around their focus areas and stuff, they, as you mentioned, actively engaged in audit discussion groups and I had numerous conversations with you know, some of the delegates there and you know, Assistant Commissioner Justin McCall was there, so talking to him around you know, some of the issues and uh, it, you know, is at my session and sort of interested to hear, you know, a lot of the stuff I spoke about Superstream and some of the challenges there. And I know that was front and centre as well with auditors in that audit discussion group too, the, um, yes. some of those Superstream challenges and seemed to continue to be a big theme with the conference whereby, you know, there are still significant challenges and the fact that Peter Burgess mentioned in his session 
that there is open dialogue, not only with the ATO around it and software providers, but also with APRA regulated funds now and trying to work through all of these teething issues to come up with a framework that you know, is meant to work as it was in, intended to. Yes, there was uh, definitely a lot of um, interesting updates in uh, Peter's session as well. Um, another sort of ongoing industry issue is obviously the whole uh, gnarly issue. So it was interesting what Peter sort of mentioned around that sort of that uh, TR 2010 ruling slash one ruling that's coming out to do with uh, contributions and whether maybe the ATO will look to sort of with that short for apply the penalty is just a contribution, whether that will be a way of minimising some of those um, big penalties that would otherwise apply. Yeah, so we've seen, it was interesting to hear him to say this number of organisations or associations that have got together around that and that the SMSF Association was one of the four chosen to work through it. And obviously there's now been a proposal put back, I think the Tax Institute it was, if I'm not mistaken, sort of had put some stuff together around that. So, yeah, so that means it's the type of insights that you get to hear from the conference to find out you know, where the lay of the land is, how it's going to obviously impact you, your clients, and, and how the work is being done. So, so Miranda, what else piqued your interest whilst uh, you attended this year's SNSF conference? Well, it was like the uh, other thing you mentioned. I think the other thing that was really evident from the conference was just how closely all the bodies have really been working together to try and achieve some really good outcomes for the industry, particularly in terms of how advice regulation works um, and trying to remove some of that red tape that's sort of uh, preventing access to advice for a lot of people. Yeah, and it's when these professional associations really come together with a unified voice, the government is far more inclined to listen. So this whole consumer-centric approach and, as you said, to get different uh, member bodies coming together from a financial advice point of view, from the accounting point of view, and to hear not only the views of those and how it impacts those members, but the consistency that we're starting to see with this really gives me some great hope for the outcomes that we might see off the back of the quality of advice review. Yeah, and obviously there's also the Law Reform Commission review, which um, also might see some positive outcomes, hopefully. Yeah. So that's a wrap, Miranda. It was a fantastic few days. I had a lot of fun. We were recording our SNSF Advisor show from our stand at Smarter SNSF at the conference. Um, We'll make sure we share a whole heap of photos as well and yeah next year's conference is in Melbourne so if you didn't get to this year's conference make sure you keep track of the fact I it's in February and we'll return to Melbourne big numbers once again will be expected it is a great event if you haven't been before and you are involved in SMSF I can't reiterate enough how much of a great learning experience it is For you, Miranda, it's like content heaven. Yes, (laughs) certainly is. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Not to mention just having everyone in one place is um, amazing. Yeah, and and again, that comes back to the relationships that you form. You know, I've made many great friends there, and and uh, and many that you meet for the first time. And so it's, I wouldn't say I've conference hardened. You know, a couple of years off. It was a little bit of a struggle at certain stages of the day. So, you, you know, <laughs> during COVID, we used to have the, uh, you might have had an afternoon siesta or something. So trying to power through, you know, another technical session in the afternoon was always a bit of a challenge. And when you've got, you know, 7.30 or whatever starts and you're still having a drink at 11 o'clock at night, but that's conference form for you. So, uh, yeah, so there's an opportunity to get back in conference form and make the Melbourne event in 2023 even bigger and better. Well, thank you for being a part of the SMSF Advisor Show where we took a detailed discussion around the SMSF Association National Conference for 2022. But as is always the case, Miranda, if people want to find out more about topics and speakers with the SMSF Advisor Show, how can they get in contact with us? Yes, so they can get in touch at editor smsfadvisoronline.com.au and we'd love to hear from you. Excellent. Well, take care and bye for now.
Interest rates are rising fast, and that means higher mortgage repayments. But some lenders have increased their rates more than others, so that could mean your clients are now paying too much for their loan. We can quickly compare your client's rate with hundreds of similar loans, so you are confident that you've got the best rate on the market, or we'll find you a better rate. Make sure your clients aren't paying the highest interest rates. Call Finney today. Visit finney.com.au and let us take the research and admin out of finding a new rate for your clients. 